Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is gestational trophoblastic disease. In this video, I will review the cell types of the placenta and their functions with a brief detour into preeclampsia and eclampsia. And next, I will compare and contrast the various types of gestational trophoblastic disease. So looking at the cells of the placenta, as you're aware, the major subtypes will be cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. I'm also going to touch briefly on intermediate trophoblast since it is relevant to one of the entities I'll be discussing. So cytotrophoblasts are undifferentiated cells that give rise to syncytiotrophoblasts, and their role is uh, to invade into the maternal spiral arteries and thereby to ensure appropriate blood flow to the placenta. Now, if we don't get uh, deep invasion, we only get shallow invasion, this can lead to preeclampsia, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, syncytiotrophoblasts are the fully differentiated epithelial cells that are in direct contact with maternal blood, and they are critical for maintaining the biochemical balance in maternal fetal circulation. In addition, they are an endocrine organ that uh, produce a number of hormones, including human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, and they also play a role in angiogenesis. Now, this third type of trophoblast I'm going to refer to is intermediate trophoblast, which are the extravillous trophoblasts that are found in the implantation site. These can give rise to placental site trophoblastic tumors, and while they can uh, release a small amount of human chorionic gonadotropin, they do produce human placental lactogen, or HPL, which can be a useful diagnostic marker. So let's take a closer look at these two cell types in the placenta. Here you can see two histologic sections. Uh, one on the left is the first trimester, one on the right is third trimester. These are taken at the same magnification. So what this tells you is that early on we have very large villi with abundant mesenchymal uh, cells. Uh, you can see here uh, much more clearly uh, the division between our syncytiotrophoblasts, which are this outer layer, and then our internal layer, which is our cytotrophoblast. When we get to the third trimester, we have a proliferation of our capillaries, and this has become a little bit more fibrotic. And the uh, layer here that is consisting of our syncytiotrophoblast and our cytotrophoblast is much thinner. So this brings us now to our digression on preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is characterized by hypertension, edema, and proteinuria, and usually presents in the third trimester. With progression and development of convulsions, it is referred to as eclampsia. Now, about 10% of patients will develop what is called HELP syndrome because there is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Now, the pathogenesis of preeclampsia, as I've already alluded to, is due to abnormal placental vasculature, and this leads to hypoxia and an imbalance of angiogenic and anti-angiogenic factors. These can lead to a widespread maternal endothelial dysfunction, and as you'll recall from an earlier video from Chapter 3, uh, we will get uh, coagulation abnormalities in response to this endothelial dysfunction. Now, uh, these symptoms will typically resolve with delivery. Let's take a look at a figure uh, from uh, uh, Robbins and Cotran, a pathologic basis of disease, to get a better idea of what is happening uh, in the placenta. So in the healthy placenta, we have our fetal uh, blood vessels uh, lined here with our uh, cytotrophoblast, and the cytotrophoblast is going to invade into this decidualized tissue and into the myometrium and along the spiral arteries, which is going to help keep them open, allowing strong blood flow here to the placenta. In preeclampsia, the cytotrophoblast only invades a short distance here into this decidualized tissue, and the spiral arteries, therefore, are not opened up. This is going to lead to hypoxia. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program, gestational trophoblastic disease. So this is defined as a proliferation of villus and or trophoblastic placental tissue. And there are four entities that we'll be considering in this video, hydatidiform mole, which can be partial or complete, invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, and placental site trophoblastic tumor. So let's begin with hydatidiform mole, beginning with what does the name mean? So, hydatid uh, comes from the Greek, meaning watery vesicle. Uh, one of the characteristics of this will be uh, these grape-like swellings of the chorionic villi. They're often referred to as being hydropic, which is associated with edema. 
Uh, the word uh, mole in this uh, instance is referring to a clump of tissue or a mass. So what we see in hydatidiform moles is cystic swelling of the chorionic villi with variable trophoblastic proliferation. Now, this used to be diagnosed at about week 14 when it was noted that uh, the uterus was much larger than it would be based on gestational age. Uh, the reason the uterus is much larger is because of these very uh, swollen chorionic villi. Now, now with uh, ultrasonography uh, and laboratory tests, we typically diagnose this in early pregnancy, or so at about nine weeks. And ultrasonography will uh, reveal these uh, dilated villi and enlarged uterus. And what we'll see as we do these uh, laboratory tests is that human chorionic gonadotropin levels are much higher and they rise more rapidly than we see in a healthy pregnancy. And this uh, increase is larger in complete moles than what we see in partial moles, and I'll explain the difference between these two types of moles in a moment. While you can get a hydatidiform mole uh, at any point uh, during the uh, reproductive uh, lifetime, uh, typically we'll see it more at the extremes, so in teenagers and people in their 40s to 50s. And the pathogenesis is uh, fertilization with excess paternal genetic material. So let's do a compare and contrast of what is called a complete mole versus a partial mole. So in a complete mole, all genetic material comes from the sperm with none from the egg. Uh, complete moles are diploid, usually 46XX. And what we will see is that all chorionic villi are abnormal, and this is not compatible with embryogenesis. Now, an important uh, characteristic of complete moles is that there is an increased risk of subsequent choriocarcinoma, as well as what is referred to as an invasive mole. I'll cover both of these in a moment. Now, with partial mole, uh, we get uh, two sperm fertilized in an ovum. So this is going to result in a triploid lesion, uh, typically uh, XXX or XXY, much less commonly XYY. And in contrast to what we see in a partial, uh, in a complete mole, uh, we will have not only our hydropic swollen villi, but also admixed normal chorionic villi. This is compatible with early embryogenesis, though not with a term pregnancy, and we uh, may identify fetal tissue. Now, while we do have an increased risk of invasive mole, there is no increased risk of choriocarcinoma. So let's look at a figure that uh, shows the pathogenesis a little bit more clearly. Here you can see in a complete mole, you, in both of these, you have an empty ovum. You can either get fertilization by a single sperm that then duplicates to form a homozygous complete mole, or you can have dispermy into an empty ovum to yield a heterozygous complete mole. For partial moles, we maintain our genetic complement from our haploid ovum, but we also have dispermy leading to a triploid uh, a mole here, which is XXX, XXY, or more uh, rarely, uh, XYY. So what does this look like? I've referred to this hydatid, this villus appearance. You can see here, so when we think about uh, something that looks like um, a vesicle filled with fluid, that's what we see in a complete mole. So this is where that term hydatid comes from. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as looking uh, like a bunch of grapes. You can see that the entire placenta is composed of these uh, bubbles of uh, clear fluid. And if we look at this histologically, we'll see again, all of the villi are going to be enlarged uh, and uh, somewhat edematous. Now let's contrast that with what we see in a partial mole, where you can see that while there are some uh, hydropic villi, so you can see some of these, uh, uh, these vesicles here, there are other areas that have the appearance of a healthy placenta, which has this somewhat shaggy, velvety look to it. Now we can appreciate this more closely uh, on uh, histology, where you can see these enlarged hydropic villi, which have these cisterns, uh, because there's so much edema fluid that it splays apart uh, the mesenchymal cells. And then admixed, we have some small fibrotic villi. So you have two populations. Let's uh, make it clearer with a compare and contrast showing our partial mole with two populations versus our complete mole where all of the villi are enlarged and hydropic. We do get variable uh, trophoblastic proliferation. Now there are some subtle differences uh, regarding where and how this trophoblast appears. That's something really for the resident level. At this point, I think it's uh, sufficient to understand that uh, there's an admixture of uh, villi and partial, whereas all of the uh, villi and complete mole uh, are hydropic. 
So uh, treatment uh, for this is uh, typically uh, with curatage. Many patients do present with a spontaneous miscarriage. Now, as I already mentioned, the uh, HCG levels are higher than what we will see of a non-molar pregnancy of similar gestational age, and following miscarriage or curatage, HCG levels will fall to non-pregnant levels. Uh, it's important to monitor HCG for six months to a year because if we do not get this decrease, it can indicate an invasive mole. So let's uh, talk about what exactly is an invasive mole. So in this, we get hydropic villi that penetrate into the uterine wall. And as we do this curatage, or as, as there's a spontaneous uh, abortion, it may be that these hydropic villi remain in that uterine wall or they persist. They can continue to grow and they can even perforate the uterine wall. Now, some of these hydropic uh, villi may embolize to different uh, distant sites, but this is not considered a metastasis because they do not uh, continue to proliferate at that site. That's in contrast to what we will see with choriocarcinoma. Uh, patients with invasive mole will present with persistently elevated HCG, which you'll be monitoring because you're aware of this risk, uh, but they can also present with vaginal bleeding or irregular uterine involvement. Invasive mole tends to respond very well to chemotherapy, but if we do have uterine rupture, the patient may uh, need a hysterectomy. So let's take a look at the histology here. You can see uh, at this low power are hydropic villi, so these very enlarged villi with this trophoblast proliferation around them, and they are invading into the smooth muscle bundles here of the myometrium. Uh, this brings us now to choriocarcinoma, which is a malignant neoplasm of trophoblastic cells. Now, there are two types of choriocarcinoma. Uh, what we're referring to in this video is gestational choriocarcinoma, in which we uh, have paternally derived DNA. You can also get a non-gestational choriocarcinoma that can arise from germ cells of the ovaries, testes, or in the mediastinum, uh, and these do not have paternally derived DNA. Now, gestational choriocarcinoma rises in about 1 in 20,000 or 30,000 pregnancies in the United States, and they can follow a variety of different conditions, including complete hydatidiform mole, uh, previous abortion, healthy pregnancy, or ectopic pregnancy. Now, this is a very aggressive malignancy. It's rapidly invasive and metastasizes widely, but fortunately responds well to chemotherapy. Now, we do not see uh, a similar response in non-gestational choriocarcinoma. It's less sensitive to chemotherapy and has a worse prognosis. So clinically, these patients will present with irregular vaginal spotting with a bloody brown fluid. And this may present months after an apparently healthy pregnancy, miscarriage, or curatage. Our HCG levels are typically going to be much higher than what we see even in a molar pregnancy, although it's important to recognize that some uh, uh, choriocarcinomas produce, produce only a small amount of HCG, and if we have tumors with extensive necrosis, uh, there will be very uh, low HCG. Now, as I mentioned, this tends to uh, metastasize widely, most commonly to the lungs, but also to the vagina, brain, and other sites. Uh, with uh, evacuation of the uterus and chemotherapy, we get about 100% remission, and there's also a high rate of cure with uh, subsequent healthy pregnancies. Now, morphologically, this is a fleshy uh, tumor with extensive necrosis and hemorrhage, and microscopically, we're going to see proliferating cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts with abundant, sometimes irregular mitotic figures and invasion into myometrium and blood vessels. So here is a um, gross uh, specimen where you can see a hysterectomy uh, specimen This is uh, that's been bivalved, and you can see here this uh, fleshy hemorrhagic and necrotic mass. Histologically, or we're going to see uh, here uh, on the right side is primarily syncytiotrophoblast, which you can recognize by the absence of uh, cell boundaries and these uh, multinucleate cells. And then you can see here there are uh, small clumps of uh, trophoblast, a cytotrophoblast as well. Now, the final entity to consider is our placental site trophoblastic tumor, which is quite uncommon, less than 2% of gestational and trophoblastic uh, neoplasms. As I mentioned, uh, it is a neoplastic proliferation of intermediate trophoblasts. Uh, and light choriocarcinoma may arise a few months after a healthy pregnancy, a spontaneous abortion, or molar pregnancy. Uh, patients will typically present with a uterine mass, with abnormal uterine bleeding, or with amenorrhea. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there may be a, a small increase in HCG, but what we'll be looking at here for a diagnosis will be human placental lactogen. 
Uh, microscopically, we'll see malignant cells diffusely infiltrating the endomyometrium, and prognosis is excellent with localized disease, but poor with disseminated disease. Uh, here is the histologic appearance. You can see here the smooth muscle bundles of the myometrium with invading uh, intermediate trophoblast. Uh, as always, here are some uh, questions uh, for you to assess what you've learned uh, in the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and pause and see if you can answer them, and if not, maybe watch the video again. And as always, uh, thank you for your time and attention. Please follow me on Twitter, and I really do appreciate uh, uh, comments down below, so thank you.